Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Duncan Shaw. Uh, the paper uh, to which I will be making some remarks is entitled Maxwell's Ether, a Solution to Entanglement. Not long ago, I became interested in the subject of entanglement. Now, don't jump to conclusions. I don't mean entanglements that disrupt marriages and complicate lives. I mean the world of the very small, where particles move in curious and sometimes inexplicable ways, where they are tied to each other in ways we still do not understand, where their movements and their characteristics, or the characteristics of their movements, are uh, somehow or other entangled. Specifically, I want to find out, I wanted to find out more about the paper written by John Bell in 1964 entitled On the Einstein Podolsky Rosen Paradox. In that paper, Bell concluded as follows In a theory in which parameters are added, to quantum mechanics to determine the results of individual measurements without changing the statistical predictions, there must be a mechanism whereby the setting of one measuring device can influence the reading of another instrument, however remote. Moreover, the signal involved must propagate instantaneously so that such a theory could not be a Lorentz invariant. Note the words, note the words, the signal must propagate instantaneously. Intriguing. A form of instantaneous action at a distance, something that most of us believe is impossible. In a 1985 uh, BBC radio interview, <coughs> Bell said, there is no way to escape the inference of superliminal speeds and spooky action at a distance, words which indicate an explanation for this apparent instantaneous action at a distance uh, will be difficult. Now, Bell's paper has resulted in a series of experimental experiments starting off in the 1960s and continuing through to this day. Why is there this apparent instantaneous action at a distance? Is there some physical cause that explains it in terms that make sense? Thus far, the legion of experiments does not provide such an explanation. A summary of the experiments, at least up to the year 2000, appears in Greenstein and Zadronk's book entitled Foundations of Quantum Physics, second edition. According to what those two authors say, all the experiments reviewed by them, and they just went through them one by one, through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, up to year 2000, all the experiments uh, were uh, or involved the emission of particles, generally photons, not ours, but generally, from a central source. And the collection of the data recorded at the receptors ranged from 180 degrees apart to 90 degrees apart. All the results bear out 
Bell's proposition of instantaneous action at a distance. More precisely, no local explanation for this curious phenomena was found in these experiments. Thus, it appears that there is instantaneous communication between the receptors that accounts for the correlation between the data uh, they record. For example, if one receptor records spin up for the particles received, the other, if the other receptor is 180 degrees apart, it will record uh, spin down. In other words, correlation between the two, but correlation in the sense that other, the two uh, sets of recorded data are 180 degrees apart. While considering, while I was considering what uh, Greenstein and uh, Jadon uh, were saying about the experiments, it struck me that all the experiments were based upon the proposition of quantum mechanics and Einstein's uh, quanta, which he spoke of in 1905, that elect the electromagnetic radiation consists of particles that travel from source to destination. This is a cornerstone proposition of quantum mechanics. There is, in these experiments, and this is what struck me particularly, no mention of the ether theory. They're all done on the basis of particles that go from source to destination, and none of them, so far as I could tell in reading everything I could, none of them were based upon the proposition that there may be an intervening ether medium. Why not? Well, I'll go into that. But to me, that is uh, an obvious and major flaw in those experiments, and one which, if one wishes to explore the possibility or the probability of ether being there in existence, therein lies an explanation for the apparent phenomenon of instantaneous action at a distance. Now this takes me into my paper, and I will be reading some papers short. But uh, uh, under heading number two, ether versus quantum mechanics. In 1865, James Clerk Maxwell published his seminal treatise, The Dynamical Theory of Electromagnetic of the electrodynamic field. In this treatise, Maxwell rejected the concept of instantaneous action at a distance. He posited that there must be a substance through which electromagnetic phenomena occur. He called this substance ether. He described it as consisting of parts and connections that have the property of elasticity and the capacity to propagate waves. Further, he described polarization as a forced state of ether that is placed under stress by electromotive force. Maxwell's ether theory has since fallen into disuse, largely as a result of the Michelson-Morley experiments that many scientists say disprove the existence of ether, and partially because Einstein, in his special relativity paper on the, thermo on the electrodynamics of moving bodies, opined that if his theory is accepted, there would be no need for ether. The present author, namely myself, 
in an article entitled Reconsidering Maxwell's Ether, published in 2014, argues that Maxwell was on the right track with his ether theory and that it should be reconsidered. The article sets out fundamental problems with quantum mechanics as raised by various prominent physicists, including David Griffiths, J.D. Jackson, Richard Feynman, Alistair Ray, Brian Cox, and Jeff Forshaw, George Greenstein, and Arthur Zajonk, and Patrick Cornelia. Just uh, moving off for a moment to that underlying article, Reconsidering Maxwell's Ether, a quote from one or two or three, perhaps, of these prominent uh, physicists. Uh, by Brian Cox and Jeff Forshaw in the quantum universe, uh, where he uh, talks about uh, 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 interference. And he says, well, we can do it if we let any single particle be in many places at once. The proposition that a particle should be in many places at once is actually a rather clear statement even if it sounds silly. Those words, even if it sounds silly, are not mine, they're his. Uh, let's see. Uh, regarding the quantum theory, he says, but has it, they say, has it provided us with any understanding of the results? It has not. Indeed, it is quite impossible to visualize what has been going on in these experiments? They present us with an intolerable state of affairs, one which appears to violate the very principles of elementary logic. Patrick Cornea, French author, who's uh, very much a supporter of Maxwell's ether, says, moreover, the experimental proofs of Newton's third law violations, which are reviewed in this book, demonstrate the existence of what Maxwell termed the luminiferous ether, a serious revision of our understanding of the physical laws governing the universe now seems unavoidable. My point is simply this. Those experiments that I mentioned a moment ago are based on quantum mechanics. Fine. In terms of quantum mechanics, they indicate certain results. But those results are not put through the theater, the filter of ether. And if, if ether happens to exist, is it an answer to this apparent instantaneous action at a distance? You bet your life, it is an answer. There's a major flaw in, uh, in respect of how so-called entanglement has been uh, handled. Now, back to my present paper, I'll continue. In 1935, Albert Einstein, D. Podolsky, and N. Rosen, in their EPR paper, Can Quantum Mechanical Description uh, of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? Uh, they concluded that the description of physical reality posed by quantum mechanics is incomplete. The Reconsidering Maxwell's Ether article, the one that underlies my present article, uh, points out that the acceptance of Maxwell's Ether opens up potential explanations of numerous problem areas of electromagnetism. One of those areas is entanglement. The present paper considers how entanglement may be explained in the context of Maxwell's ether. Now, jumping ahead in the paper, I'll continue. The distinction between photons and ether cells is important. As you will recollect, the uh, 
most of these tests were carried out with photons sent out one by one or in groups that travel from source to destination. At least that's what's said about them. On the other hand, we have ether cells, which are the things from which ether itself is constructed. They are the stuff of the medium of ether. Uh, now continuing. As noted earlier, Maxwell considered polarization as the forced state of a medium caused by the application of electromotive force. In contrast, in the quantum mechanics approach to entanglement, polarization is viewed as a state of photons that are traveling from source to destination, such as spin up and spin down. With this distinction in mind, visualize space as being permeated by the medium of ether. Make the assumption that the ether can be polarized by electromagnetic force. This is that central force it's talking about used in all these experiments. <coughs> Picture polarization forcing ether to collectively form into three dimensional patterns. With these patterns providing planes of polarization through which electromagnetic waves travel. The planes of polarization <coughs> rotate and when they do this causes rotation of the electromagnetic waves. The next step is critical. Visualize a central source sending up electromotive energy in opposite directions. If the ether theory is applicable, the electromotive force will polarize the ether medium in both directions. Assuming that this, in fact, occurs, it stands to reason that the patterns of polarization in both directions will be correlated the correlation is caused by the polarization resulting from the common source of electromotive force being applied to the common surrounding medium. Because the electromotive force that causes the polarization emanates from a central source and is directed outward in opposite directions, it follows that the pattern of the polarized ether in one direction will be the mirror image of the pattern of the polarized e ether in the opposite direction. Thus, the recording of the nature of the waves arriving at the receptors uh, will, should give opposite readings. Further, while the readings at the, re at the receptors may be characterized as spin up and spin down, but the receptors are actually receiving rotating waves, then it seems reasonable to assume that the readings are being mischaracterized and are in fact rotations of the electromagnetic waves that are being sent through the medium of the ether. Those last words I have just added on my own. In this picture of events, no instantaneous communication between the receptors is needed. Indeed, no communication at all is necessary. This is because entanglement is the result of polarization of the ether medium. And the polarization is set by the electromotive force that emanates from the common source. Thus, apart from the receptors being recording devices, they play no role in entanglement. The idea of uh, instantaneous action at a distance emanates from the receptors being far enough apart such that there is not sufficient time for what happens at one receptor to be communicated at the speed of light 
to the other receptor, so it cannot have any effect upon the other receptor unless, as the experiments suggest, there is instantaneous action at a distance. Well, to me, instantaneous action at a distance is not acceptable. To most scientists, it is not acceptable. So the idea that what happens at one receptor can affect what happens at the other receptor is simply a no-go. So, what else? All right, if what occurs at the two receptors is set up by the polarization of the ether right at the start, then you've got an explanation as to why there is correlation between what happens at one receptor and what happens at the other. That's the substance of my paper. I'm open to questions. Yes. Does the polarization of the ether just happen to be one particular way at one particular time that day, for instance? Or does the polarization of the ether change from clockwise to counterclockwise sometimes? Or does it depend on the, the, the energy of the particle? Does it ride the right-handed waves sometimes and left-handed waves other times? Uh, as I conceive uh, of polarization, uh, it is a continuous thing. As long as there is the emanation of the uh, uh, electric force at the, uh, at the center uh, apparatus that's being used, as long as it continues, it will continue to exert force on the ether and it will set up the polarization of the ether in whatever manner happens to suit the ether and suit the particular force that is laid on the ether. Hmm. So, yes, there can be changes if the force that uh, causes the polarization changes, the polarization itself uh, would, of course, change. Hmm. Yes? Yes. Duncan was kind enough to send me a copy of his paper. Very well researched paper. It is difficult to accept the concept of instantaneous action at a distance. It is difficult to accept such a concept. In which case, one is forced to consider an intervening medium between the cause and the effect. Some call it ether or ether, but I look at it as electric field. What you call ether cells may as well be electric charges. Electric fields emanate from matter and crisscross space, vanishing at infinite, infinite distance from the source. You may call such fields the ether, if you want. <laughs> so the question is not whether one believes in the ether or not, but what is one's concept of the medium in which electromagnetic waves and other things and light travel. There will have to be some kind of medium. Need not, it need, it will not be a material medium. But if you accept it as an electric field, which balance everywhere in space, but the fields are there, emanating from, from matter, balancing everywhere. But as light disbalance will cause a wave to travel along the electric field at the speed of, of light. So here, if this concept is uh, so then we have a medium all over the place accepting transmission of wave and the speed of light and uh, the issue of ether is settled.
that would have to be something. I, I, I think I'm following what you're saying. Uh, one aspect of, of, of what you said, it, I think you said it need not be material. I think it does need to be material. I think something exists or it doesn't exist. If it exists, it's material. And uh, But apart from that, your idea that uh, the ether, whatever it is, may form an electric field. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, to, to me, uh, the concept of field is like a field of daffodils or a field of wheat or a field of any other thing that there might be, but it's a field of things that exist. And I, I myself, I look upon those things as material and I look upon those as being in substance, what we call ether. And uh, yes, that there, there uh, may be, and uh, soon the there will be not only uh, uh, electricity attributes to the field, but there may, and I think are, also magnetic attributes to the field. Are we on the same wavelength? Yes, do you consider okay. an electric field as material? Yeah. Yeah. It is a what? I will, I will, yeah. I will, I will take that, yeah. Okay. It, it, has, it has energy, it has mass, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, I want to really do touch on both aspects. I mean, of course, field, material, no material. If it is uh, energetic, then matter, as we know it, actually may come just as a structuring of that energetic uh, uh, substance. And here, regarding the polarization, you know, I just maybe want to kind of suggest maybe to consider structuring as a maybe some, some, some wider. So, Context, the concept of, of, of polarization. Uh, in particular, there was kind of um, recently one result by quantum mechan mechanical uh, experimentalist who took some structure like, like a proton or some condensate in the magnetic field and they just took two parts out of each other. And they remained in the situation as though uh, connected, still connected by. The umbilical cord, uh, and then of course, if you would uh, change the uh, rotation or spin of one, definitely the other one would like immediately uh, follow there. So it's kind of really kind of structuring feature of the, the self structuring. And actually, Maxwell has expected there that it is many many people, and luckily, it has been recently, last ten years, thirty years old, the results in the context of the later in dynamics where those things. Thank you for your comment. Any other questions? Yes? Are you talking about uh, polarization? Are you talking about circular polarization? Of, of, or, uh, and how is it generated from the uh, source? I, um, as I understand polarization, there are two entirely different concepts. One, if you uh, accept the idea that particles, uh, that electromagnetic magnetic radiation consists of particles that are sent from A to B. Those particles may have a certain spin or a certain orientation, and there is an approach to polarization. That's not the one I accept. The second one, as I, as I conceive it in my mind, is where there is a medium and there is pressure put on that medium, electric pressure, I'll call it electromotive force. That causes the particles of the medium to assume positions in regard to each other. And, uh, and when that occurs, that as I see it, is polarization. And what that means is that when there is, uh, when there are waves through that medium, in other words, the 
the corpuscles or the cells are striking each other in, and the energy of that makes its way through the medium. Uh, that is, to some extent, controlled by the actual configuration of that medium that was set up by the uh, uh, electromotive force that polarized the medium. I hope I've answered your question. Or, or <laughs> have I not? Yes, uh, yes, please. OK, one more. No yes, problem. Sorry. Uh, please, those who believe in the ether, can I ask this question? Do you see it as a medium uniformly filling the whole of infinite space? Okay, if I may answer the question. If you could think of some really kind of uh, beginnings, right? You could think of ether as really consisting of some kind of particles that are moving in all directions and algebraically, algebra, uh, when, you, when, you, when you sum up it uh, algebraically, there will be zero, right? Nothing. But if those particles are like gyroscope substances, they are hitting each other. Because of, of, of rotation, they precess. By using Navier-Stokes equations, even not fully nonlinear, but particular nonlinear, it can be shown mathematically that those uh, particles are tending to structure into exactly toroidal vortexes. I mean, torus vortexes. So th there is a, a compound uh, a movement both along the circle, ar around the, 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 the donut, and from the inside of the donut out. And then you know, this kind of uh, uh, conversion of that kind of energy, top thermal energy, into the kinetic energy of the structures. And then we can relate to the, the mass and so on and so on. And those very uh, uh, now, maybe, next level uh, created uh, structures, then they behave similar way. Then again, they hit each other, process, and then form, form new, new kind of level of, of, of size of vortexes. So it appears that that happened on all, at all levels, up to galactical and maybe more. And then out from there, there might be that the very basic that maybe lower level, I mean, to which we can think, uh, get back as a material. So now, I mean, we have something like Earth and drag as actually being that particular uh, planet as Earth in the ether, in the uh, par for part of ether, and then dragging of ether becomes very <laughs> obsolete. I mean, the Earth is part of that part of ether around. In some uh, distant area, the ether might be of the kind, homogeneous and isotropic. But those particles are still moving around, but not yet maybe having been structured into, into particular structures that would be structured again and so on. So, so as I commented the other day, it might be really so that we have a giant recycling process on the very same principles. And if we would be able uh, to, 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 to uh, extract the uh, modern ratio out of these mechanisms, and what the ratio is seen everywhere in each structure, at each levels, then I think we have very, very good. Very, very, very good. Okay. Uh, to, to have a moment, uh, can I take one more question? Uh, uh, one more, but it has to be quick, folks. Well, I, I was We're tight today. I was answer Moose's question, and let's, let's all help him, but just one, one question at a time. You asked, is it infinite in space, the ether? How many people have ever heard of an ether described it's only in packets? I have never, right? Is anybody? So I think you, most of the people here are going to say yes. First part of your question. Is ether infinite? And I think we all agree yes. Right? You asked that well, question. I, I may comment no, on that later. Not right. Right. I, 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 well, but you asked, do we think it's infinite? Yeah, maybe you think it's infinite. Well, again. But I, there's nobody in the room who didn't think it was in. I, I don't know. Okay, okay let's, we're going we're gonna to have to, to okay. drop this because I know we can go a while. We're real tight today, and I apologize. So thank you so much, Duncan. You got, take your fights out into the hallway. No. <laughs>